Books make you hope. Books make you dream. Books make you laugh. Books make you scream. This is the Books That Make You Show, discussing books with authors and experts, unraveling the inner pages of all the books that help make us who we are. Welcome, everybody, to the Books That Make You Show. I'm your host, Desiree Duffy. And today we're talking about books that make you thrilled by an edge of your seat techno thriller. Who doesn't like a book that blends mystery, suspense, and technology? Techno thrillers are one of the most captivating genres nowadays, and with good reason. It seems like the world of tech is moving faster than us mere mortals can even keep up with. And our guests today are the writing duo of Breakfield and Berkey. Now, their latest book in the Magnolia Bluff Crime Chronicles series is The Ransom Enigma. In it, a black male letter disguised as a housewarming gift sets off a chain of events that leads to murder, mayhem, all of that fun stuff. Hello, Breakfield and Berkey. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Desiree. Always a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Desiree. We're going to have some fun. Okay, so why don't we start by just give us the the lowdown. What's going on in the Ransom Enigma? The Ransom Enigma, you kicked it off very well. There is a ransom note, obviously, that, uh, you know, gets everybody's panties in a wad about, oh, my gosh, something's going to be told if we don't pay. And this is dire and this is awful. And and um, it's addressed to Joe. And Joe's husband sees it and he goes ballistic. He's mad and he's out for blood for whoever this person is that would dare threaten his bride. Unfortunately, he makes that comment in front of the uh, police chief. So two days later, JJ's found someplace else unconscious next to a dead man. Is it the um, blackmailer or is it somebody else? And why is he there? I love that setup. That's so intriguing. All right. We've got a lot to kind of unpack here. Now, this is a book that's in uh, an overarching series. So can you maybe we take a step back and describe the series for us? Sure. A bit. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, it starts a long time ago. A good friend of ours, um, Caleb. It says that our note says, quick, quick, quick. I need some blog material. Everybody, write me a short story about this uh, this boat. And it's kind of a dumpy looking boat, you know, washed up on the mud. And we have we had so much fun doing that. One of the other overachievers said, hey, let's build a mythical uh, city in Texas, of course. Um, and uh, we'll all write books uh, with a slice, our, our point of view in that particular area, Magnolia. Bluff. Um, and it's one of those places that people are just dying to get in there. So um, we share characters. We uh, we share a little bit of plots, the stories here and there between everything, uh, between all of us. Um, and it's um, it's an intriguing uh, uh, an event. Each year we each do a book. We're up to third season and our book, The Ransom Enigma, will uh, will debut in August of this year. And the neat thing about this Magnolia Bluff Crime Chronicles is each of the books is totally an independent book. So even though we share the town and we do share some characters, the different point of view, these are all inclusive within each book. So it it makes it easy for readers to pick up any of them, though. I'll tell you, learning how Magnolia Bluff buries them, it's worth reading all of them. (laughs) I love that. That's such a cool idea. And 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 is this what the underground authors are? Is that what that is? Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Yep. We are all underground authors. And um, most of the authors, well, all of the authors that are writing in this particular series are not only high achievers, but they write other things as well. So it's it's just a, a fun way to collaborate. Yeah. Now we, we did run into a couple of hiccups and speed bumps. Um uh, you have to be careful because what they do is sometimes the character that you want to borrow from them, they got whacked in that book. And, and it's like, oh, no, quick, you know, uh, get somebody else, Charles. So you, you can't use that one because they're gone. 
<laughs> oh, that that's got to be hard. So, okay, right, I want to ask you guys about being a writing duo, but that's a new spin on it. You're you're writing characters that somebody else might be using, and you might not have total control over that character. What what what's that like? What's it like that collaborative energy that you guys have? So between us as co-authors, we've we've kind of always written that way through through our own books and then into this uh, underground author group. We we share things over technology. So, you know, ideas, conversations, we get on meetings like this and share ideas um, about how we want the story to go. We're very, very lucky in that Charles's wife is our first round editor. Uh, so it makes it very, very nice kind of family deal going on. Uh, and we've known each other for a very long time. So it, we have a good working rapport. We both came from technology. Well, and the other thing was that uh, we did a lot of teaching and uh, uh, technology uh, web webinars and seminars to uh, our colleagues to be able to teach them some of the, uh, the, the tougher uh, applications. So uh, we've been collaborating for so long that it would be hard not to. I, you know, there it is. Okay. <laughs> good point. And I do want to talk to you both about technology and, you know, I know we have finance in there, we've got cybersecurity, but first I want to talk about the touch of romance that you guys put into your writing as well. Can you talk about that? Yeah. A little bit? What is life without, you know, a little humor, a little mystery and a little romance. So um, we do. Um, what's interesting about our collaboration and because we do know each other's writing style is is we each take a chapter as an example uh, and then we bring it together and smooth it so it sounds like one voice. And we do have conversations about there is no woman on the world that will ever say that, Charles. We're just going to have. And conversely, you know, he's going to say there's no ever use that term. So, so we get it so that it's smooth and quite honestly, it's very hard to tell exactly who created a given chapter. And the biggest compliment we get is when uh, Charles's wife comes in and goes, who wrote that? And he goes, yes. And that's one of the best compliments because it's like, oh, they can't tell. Like you exactly. said, you smooth everything out like that. That's amazing. That's a really cool process. Uh, mad props for doing it that way. But okay, technology. Let's 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 talk tech, shall we? So, sure. Charles, I'll start with you. In the world of cybersecurity and everything that you see going on in the world today, any thoughts on things that people should be aware of, or might you know you you might see kind of coming down the pike that us average folks might not be aware of? Um, the biggest problem, honestly, is complacency. Oh. I've always done it this way. I've always used a, a, a password of my of my kids or my my spouse or you know my pet, and that's the same uh, information I put out on social media. That's where they troll for that information. That's a, that's an easy place to be able to find your weak spot because you're bragging about things that that you like, and it's easy to be caught flat-footed, and that's when you don't want to be doing that. Uh, the uh, in the cyber world, it's the bad guys are always ahead of the good guys. You have to play catch up to be able to stop them. <clears throat> One mistake and they're in. I mean, that, that's you know, the classic example. <clears throat> what was it just uh, you know, last week? Microsoft said, oops, um, uh, my bad. Um, all your servers are offline and uh, basically the planet is shut down. Um, and it wasn't our fault, man. Uh, it, it's not our fault because somebody said, hey, let's just do this, do this update. And crippled all the machines. And I haven't seen this term in a long time. BS, BSOD, blue screen of death. We used to laugh about that. That was um, when they finally, I haven't seen it for years <clears throat> to see that could come back. So those are the kinds of things that uh, we worry about, um, we write about, um, and we think awareness is your best defense for and cybersecurity. You don't want to hear all the mind-numbing detail to go along with how to be able to soon do some of the stuff, where the, the attack vectors are. But it's important to know that don't be sloppy with the stuff that, uh, that's important. Your, your finances, you're the people that you care about. 
And, and Desiree, for listeners of your show, there is some tips and tricks that we have on our website as free downloads if people want to visit and, and take advantage of that. Um, it's not everything. It's not exhaustive, but, you know, some of the easy stuff. Let's let's just go do it. Yeah. Well, and especially in the world of finance as well. I mean, that's got to play into it. I don't know if you want to speak to that, perhaps a little bit, Rox. Well, yeah. I mean, one of the things you want to make sure of is that yeah, two-factor authentication, not just one password. And we don't use passwords. We use passphrases. Uh, we always mm-hmm. preach that, you know, passphrases like, uh, um, need to buy, uh, you know, rat poison to kill the neighbor because he parked on my lawn again. You know, stuff like that, that that's easy to remember. You're ticked about the guy parking on your yard. Um, but nobody on the planet would be able, you know, with, a, uh, with a quantum computer, would be able to uh, decipher that kind of a password. So, you know, make it difficult and then go someplace else. That's the key phrase. And I, and I think the other thing that's on the rise right now that I've been seeing is this constant email requests for money. Oh, you need to pay this bill. Oh, gosh, do it in the next 35 seconds or we'll shut down your accounts. Do this. Most financial institutions, all financial institutions will not ask for money that way. That's not how they conduct business. So anything that is in the email that is immediate attention must do or die. Um, that's pretty much going to be a scam. Yeah. yeah. You know, the yeah. best action. Click here. Yeah. Click here. <laughs> yeah. The click yeah. here. Click here. Never this, click this there. Don't, here. Don't don't click. <laughs> the the best yeah. action is to, is to call your institution separately, not through the email. Don't click links that you aren't aware of, and just that'll help you immensely. Yeah. Well, and it's getting scary too with artificial intelligence and the sophistication of scammers. Uh, my husband was traveling not too long ago and he texted me. He's like, if anybody comes to the house saying they're from the power company, do not answer the door. And I'm like, why? What's going on? They not only called and left a message and texted him, they knew our physical address as well. And that was scary because we didn't know how sophisticated these scammers are. And in some cases, with language models that are out there that can clone voices. People are cloning voices of loved ones and somebody who might not be aware that that technology even exists might get a phone call from somebody asking for money or a text from somebody from an email address that looks like it's their granddaughter. So it really is getting scary, isn't it? It it really is. You've got it spot on. Uh, And it just, it, you just have to be aware Uh, And you can't be too busy with your life not to take a breath and just be aware. Uh, But they are more sophisticated because that's their full time job. They don't have a job because if they can get one person a day to be a little fish that keeps delivering money, why should they work? Yeah, exactly. It's scary. Now, with your backgrounds as well, and your writing techno thrillers, how much of that are you bringing in and using in your writing? All of it. Yeah. So each book, like in the series that's behind us right now, uh, which is our tech, techno thriller series, um, there is a certain threat within each of them. I mean, things like ransomware, which are headlines. Things like artificial intelligence, again, another headline that's going on. Um, cryptocurrency. Um, you know, living forever, which is a wonderful example of people uh, kind of uh, just trying to manipulate you and do really bad things physically to people if they want to. Um, identity theft is another one. So, yeah, we take a focus in each of the books on some of the main threats. And what about the brighter side of things? Because yeah, technology and the world we live in, it can seem overwhelming and scary. We've got to be on alert. But there's some exciting things that are happening in the world of technology. And even cryptocurrency might seem a little weird, but there's some cool stuff going on with the idea of blockchain and how that might be revolutionizing the way we do business. Thoughts on that? Yeah, um, so uh, for the blockchain stuff, (coughs) cryptocurrency is one Avenue for it, but um, it's also being used in uh, the supply chains. Um, it's nice to know where you know maybe tainted food came from, so you can intercept it at the source. Um, parts that uh, aren't uh, up to spec, 
you be, you, you're going to be able to track that back fast. So using it to be able to monitor each one of the steps in a supply chain for a particular part or food, medical supplies, all of that, um, that's, a, that's an excellent application. Uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it's being used in so many places. It, it's hard to actually find a place where it's not being. Um, they're trying to use it. So, um, yeah, there's great stuff there. I mean, every technology has a good side. Um, and it probably is originally created because there is a good side. Unfortunately, you have people that, again, their full time job is wreaking havoc. And so they want to slip in and do things. It's like the ransomware stuff, the same kind of thing. Um, if AI can get together and defeat ransomware, hey, we got another application going there. Yeah. Well, even if we go way, way back, the first science fiction book ever written was based on science. What if? What if we could resurrect the dead? It's Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, right? It's when okay. science starts to happen. And at the time, there was scientists who were experimenting with electricity. All of that was new, and they would zap a, a, a dead rodent into a twitch. And that yep. was what spurred her creativity and created one of the ultimate and most you know, iconic horror slash sci-fi novels of all time. What do you think about literature like that? Do you look back at some of the greats? throughout history and see where they use technology at the time that nowadays we're just like, oh, it was just electricity. Who, who inspires you? So one of my original one was 2000 Leagues Under the Sea because that technology was way before its time in so many different ways and so many different avenues. And, and again, it's part of that imagination and creativity and someone had a good idea. Um, so it, can it remain good or is there something bad that somebody will uncover in everything? It's, it, but that's one of my inspirations. What was yours? Um, I'd have to say it was uh, Frank Herbert's Dune uh, books <laughs> and uh, the stuff that uh, uh, Kevin J. Anderson and uh, his son, uh, um, Frank Herbert Jr., have, uh, have, have put together up practically uh, their benchmark, as far as I'm concerned, from science fiction um, 10,000 years in the future, and here's what the, the, uh, the planet or the uh, galaxy looks like. <clears throat> yeah, and it's wonderful when you can speculate like that. Speaking of which, I'll ask you as uh, fiction authors and fans of sci fi and speculative fiction, what do you see happening in the future? If we could get out your crystal ball, what do you think that people can look forward to in the world of technology and where our society is going in the next, oh, I don't know, 10, 20, 100 years? Well, it should be fairly easy to be able to predict AI something or other. <clears throat> uh, you know, how to be able to uh, control it, that's going to be a little more difficult. There's actually a, a couple of uh, great stories that came out of the 1950s where a um, supercomputer took over and everybody started working for it. So um, we're in that, uh, that, that area where it's like you've got the religious people for AI. Oh, you've got to take it. it it's uh, embrace it. Uh, it's the new job. Uh, uh, and then and, and, and people like us that are skeptical and say, I, yeah, not without the guardrails, buddy. Um, I got to arguing with the people from Microsoft uh, one day in an interview, and they said, well, 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 you know, this is all the neat stuff it'll do. And they showed us a great demo. I said, what about here, here, and here? And he went, I hate it when people like you, you know, pin me on stuff like that. Doggone it. He was really indignant. And, but uh, it was the guardrails that, that, that tripped him up. How do, you, how do you intercept something? Because you can't put the genie back in. No, and I want to know, you know, the things that worry me are, are am I talking to Desiree or am I talking uh, to somebody else to, you know, I, I like the real kind of thing. And one of the things that's very scary about AI kind of functionality is, as you said, somebody can clone a voice earlier and make it sound like somebody. They can do the same thing with an image, um, but it can have good purpose. It can be very helpful. But then it just can a little narrow, nasty side where someone takes advantage of someone or, or whole, whole cities or countries. And that's where our minds tend to uh, um, run, run 
rampant uh, is, okay, how can this be used by the dark net? Somebody from the dark net and use it incorrectly. Um, and then before we know it, you know, we're, we're mapping out this uh, the scenario of this like, it's horrific. I mean, we, we were doing the cryptocurrency uh, one, book 10, and we postulated that Venezuela was going to have to go to a cryptocurrency uh, um, economy because of the way that they've ruined the everything uh, in that in that country. And doggone it, if Madeira didn't announce that they were going to do that just before our book was going to be released, and I was so ticked, I sent him a note saying, "Hey, dude, can you can you hold off on the economy <laughs> just, just a little bit? And, uh, we want bragging rights, and and you're obviously a, a lady of a uh, uh, good breeding and um, I won't recount to you what he said in his email back, but basically the net net of it was no thanks. <laughs> That's funny. And, you know, all of your points are so valid and it does seem scary because of the fact. And I, I think that's one of the things, too, with open AI. You, you mentioned Microsoft. They're all doing it. They're all in this arms race to develop and release their own different versions of AI and I have it on my phone. I can talk to it and I can have it do things very much like you, you've seen the demos and everything, very much like the movie yeah. Her, it's been equated yeah. to. But what I can do as an individual is kind of crazy. And in some regards, it's like, well, we should all have access to it. But then to your points, should we? Because of all the bad actors that are out there and all the nefarious ways that it could possibly be used. Yeah. I think one of the things we need to consider as a society is when we allow individuals to have that. Do we want to limit young people from having it until they have learned certain basic skills? Do not even allow their offspring to have any kind of a device initially. Yeah, the yeah. parking piece for us is the uh, the point where, okay, you've been around for a while, Desiree, we've been around for a while, we know the the proper answer, okay? and the argument is always, well, here's something to do it for you faster, and uh, um, but not always correctly. Like they're called, uh, in, in, in the AI world, AI world, it's called it having hallucinations, coming back with false information. Now, if you don't have the background, if you don't have the knowledge, you don't have the expertise to be able to say, this is wrong, what kind of bozo would take this information? If that's all you're, you're, you're trusting, you're in deep yogurt. I'll tell you right now. It's like um, having AI learn everything from social media. On a good day, it could be a good thing. <laughs> On a bad day, it could be a really bad thing. Uh, if oh. that's the only learning model that they're they're leveraging for for their tools. So you got to be careful. Right. Well, and then we get into all sorts of questions about IP and, you know, being able to take somebody's, whether it's their likeness or their voice or something that they've written, something that exists that we, you put out there, you don't necessarily grant permission for that to be used in a commercial fashion. And that's what ChatGPT and the others are doing. I subscribe to it. So ChatGPT, OpenAI, those folks are getting money from me. But the information that that was originally pulled from, from the internet, whether it's social media or books or somebody's paper, that was all created for an intention. And that was never created with the idea that somebody else would be able to sell it and make money off of it using AI. Right. Exactly. We, we, a couple of years ago, we had somebody read one of our books and do a review. And the minute we read that review, we realized that it was done by AI because of the content of it had was relative to our series, but it had no relationship to that particular book. So somebody had trolled and created something. Um, and it, it, we asked them to pull it down because it was, it was untrue and it was not done by a person. Uh, the other thing that was the clue to that was it was turned around in um, a day. Most of our novels are like almost 300 pages. Typically, that doesn't get turned around in a day. Yeah. So, so as authors, what do you think about using AI as a writing assistant 
or for <laughs> writers to use it. I'm not going to ask if you think it's okay for it to write books, because I think I know the answer there. But there are a lot of authors who are using it to help them, you know, whether it just be copy editing or fleshing out characters, world building. Thoughts on that? Where's the guardrails on that? When when is it um, okay? It's okay for you know a little bit. Uh, okay, I need more more help here. I need hey, will you write this chapter? I, I'm in kind of a hurry. Uh, can you write this book? Because uh, I know you can do it. You you you. I've given you all the. Where do you stop? We see um, pushback from the publishing industry. Big bold letters that says, "If this was AI generated, take your stuff and go home." So yep. we try to keep at arm's length. And that's, that's, yeah, it takes a lot longer to you know, turn out craftsmanship. I get it. That's just going to be their answer. We don't want to use it. Though we have used it specifically to create images <clears throat> and, and it, you know, just to kind of give some visual, visual hints and whether we played with it to see if we want to keep something like that, but the writing, no, it's kind of for us kind of a no. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's important for us as technologists to know, how does this stuff work? And then here, point out where, okay, here's where it's poisonous. And uh, this is where it, it'll, you know, it'll come send torpedoes into, into your uh, your business model. So we like knowing that so we can say, thank you, no. Yeah, I think the, as readers, there's, a, there's an agreement that we have with the writer, or actually the writer more or less gives the agreement to the reader that you are able to climb into the skin of the fictional characters they create, or in the case of nonfiction, into their experiences, memoirs, et cetera. There's like this understanding that this is from a real person, that it is not artificially generated. There's just something about reading a story. It, it, it's kind of neat to read it the first time. Oh, that was written by AI. I just want to see what that was like. Much like to your point, it's interesting. But then the soul, the heart, is missing from that writing, knowing that there wasn't a person behind it. Exactly. There's even tools out there now that will help you if you're using AI. Uh, it, it, it's now easy to spot because there's tools to be able to say, was this written by AI? There's actually a program to be able to camouflage the AI writing so that it doesn't, it doesn't get picked up by AI. It's like, it, are you guys watching yourselves? This sounds insane. I, I can I can I can make money writing a story about this kind of lunacy. I think exactly. you're spot on though about the heart and soul being absent from that kind of content, and I I think that our creative abilities as people is is not it's unmatched by AI. Definitely, Charles and Rox. Oh, this is so exciting and interesting but we're running up against the clock. Can you let folks know where they can go to find out more about each of you, as well as find out where they are, find the book, The Ransom Enigma and your other books as well? Certainly. So if you go to uh, enigmaseries.com, you've got links to all of our eBooks, our paperbacks and our audibles. So if, these are, if you've got an audience that uh, listen to this on, uh, you know, on their drive time, um, perhaps they would be more interested in the audibles for all of our books that are done by our uh, voice actor, Derek Scholes. Um, we're quite proud of the work that he does. And he's the voice of the, the series. And, and other, I mean, we're, we're on all of the normal buying places, um, Desiree. Uh, so we look forward to people connecting with us, downloading free things, uh, subscribing to our fun newsletter and just, um, we love fans. We love reviews. Excellent. Charles and Rox, thank you so much for being here today on the Books That Make You Show and sharing with us your books and the lively discussion about technology and AI and what the future may hold. Hopefully in the future, we'll have you back on the show. Cool? Oh, I hope so. Thank you. We'd love to come back. All right. And everybody, thank you for being with us today on the Books That Make You Show. You can find out more about us on our website. It is booksthatmakeyou.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. 
you to make sure you ring the bell, subscribe. That way you never miss a books that make you show. And please be sure to sign up for our Webby award-winning books that make you newsletter. Until next time, all of my bookish buddies, please enjoy all of the books that make you exactly who you are. The host and executive producer of the books that make you show is Desiree Duffy. Sound mastering and engineering by Dave Napox. Social media and content promotion by Siddi Jahagirdar. Copywriting and editing by Mike Robinson. The Books That Make You Show is an award-winning podcast produced by Black Chateau Enterprises.